got a good granddaddy that'll buy you a big wheel too. All right, all right, come on. We were talking about uh, a God-centered life, right? I'm, 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 I'm telling you, I'm telling you, before I go on, God is talking to every last one of us. You just got to get the clutter away from your eyes and away from your ears so you can hear his voice. It's not that he's not talking to us. It's not that he doesn't care enough to talk to me personally. He does. He, he's, he is so dynamic that he can talk to all of us at once. Right? And so, and so, and so you got to get to a place and I'm not telling you to be deep. I'm talking about understanding. You got to get to a place to where you can hear him. Amen. Amen. So we were talking about a God-centered life, right? And 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 this week, I, I, I was waiting. look at the end to night, and the reason why was because I was waiting for something new, and nothing new came. And so, God, I told you last week that God teaches me through experience, right? And so, because He teaches me through experience, um, it leads me to study in the area. Something for from as long for as long as I've been preaching. For, for the 10 years that I've been preaching, something will happen, will lead me to the word. And when it leads me to the word, I realize that this is what God wants me to teach. Well, when, when, when I go over again, a lot of times it's just because he hasn't given me experience. And I take that as this is where he wants me to stay, right? And so, and so we were talking about this second Peter and where it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, grace and peace. And so, and so last week I said this, I said, uh, the Bible, well, well, we referred to grace as unmerited favor, that, that, that God placed his favor on our lives without us earning it. But I believe that this is the key to the door. I believe that this is the way that we step into the door. But, but, but in order to get more grace, it says that it can be multiplied through knowledge, right? And so, and so, and so this threw me for a loop because I, I've always looked at grace as unmerited favor, right? Which is what it is. We didn't earn it. Jesus earned the favor that is on our lives. Jesus earned the grace that was on our lives. But it, but it says that in order for this, these two aspects of grace and peace to be multiplied, we got to learn about who he is, right? And so a lot of times... The reason why, now listen, don't, don't take this wrong, but the reason why you look for counsel so much is because you lack in the place of knowledge. And, and, and the reason why you not lack in knowledge is because you lack in the time that you spend with God, right? And so now, she said, oh, you like that, Jamie? You like that one? Okay, that's good. I'm glad you liked it. So grace and peace be multiplied unto you through knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So that means that I have to spend time in prayer. Spending time in prayer is not necessarily you running your mouth. Spending time in prayer is you asking God for instructions and then you sit and wait for the instructions. When we had when we had prayer at the church, remember Kenyatta, we had prayer in the church that morning and I started telling everyone to be quiet because everyone was praying at once and we were praying and praying and God said to me while I was quiet, they are praying, telling me what they want, but they're not listening for the instructions. I told everybody, be quiet and listen for God. Be quiet, just be quiet. There's about 10 or 15 of us in there and everybody's praying a deep prayer, but you're telling God what you want, but not waiting. And most of us pray and tell God what we want and then we get up without listening to see what he wants us to do with what we ask for, right? And so now I realize that in order for me to have knowledge, I need for the one who has the knowledge to give me the information. And, and if that's the case, then I need to be able to spend time with him in order to receive what he wants me to know about who he is, right? We get so deep, right? We get so deep and we ask God in these long hour long prayers, but we never stop and wait to see what he has to say about it, right? And so, and so I've learned that in order for me to hear, I need to shut up. Just to shut up, Jamal. I, I, I went 18 months asking all these people around me for some help. And I finally just said this, hey man, I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to help me. Just like that. And I stopped. I didn't have a deep, long prayer. All of a sudden, it was like he was said to me, I was waiting for you to ask. You popped up, not just you specifically, but then another person popped up and another person. And then all of a sudden, more people popping up. People that weren't on my radar, people that I didn't know, but, 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 but they were sent by God to help me. 
right? I was trying to do it on my effort, but at the moment that I went to the one who is the source of all things, right? He is the source of knowledge. I showed you the other day after Bible study that the Bible says that theology is the science of all sciences. There is no science without God, right? And so, and so now, if he is the beginning and the end of all things, if he is the alpha and the omega, why do we start with ourselves instead of starting with God? You see what I'm saying? Okay, come on, Alice, come on, come on. So, so check this out. It says this epignosis, this knowledge, denotes the intelligent comprehension of an object or matter, whether this comes for the first time, whether it comes for the first time, whether this is an epiphany, whether this is, this is first time knowledge, right? Whether it's something like that, or it comes afresh in consideration of the one who grasped it. Have you ever had an oh, 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 oh moment with God, right? Oh my God, I never saw that before. You gotta take that and make it a part of yourself. Because if you don't take that and make it a part of yourself, it begins, ha have you ever have you ever thought about something and wish that you wrote it down, right? And then, and then you get to, to a place and be like, man, what was that that I was thinking of the other day? The reason why is because it didn't become a part of you. It didn't become a part of you. When you find something out about God, you have to immediately take care of it and make it a part of you. You got to make it a part of you. You have to put it and write it on the tablet of your heart. You have to allow God this special place, this compartment, this filing cabinet inside your soul that you adopt as soon as information comes. You got to be a godly sponge, that not, but, but, but a particular sponge, that you're not absorbing everything, not every wind of doctrine, not anything that comes around that seems spiritual, that seems spooky, that seems deep, but these things that are revelations of who Jesus Christ is and who he is in our lives. This is the things that you soak up. These are the things that you make a part of you. Not because you saw someone else do it, but because God revealed it to you. Amen? That's what we want. We want direct revelation from the throne room. We don't want to be just parakeets doing what pastor does or doing what first lady does because, because our personality we sit and we chill. But your personality may be that you praise God. But because, because everyone sits around and chills, you might not be feel comfortable to praise God, but someone might be scared to praise God because pastor and first lady are chillers and everybody else became chillers and then we got a cold church. If you are on fire for God, I need you to be hot for God. I need you to serve God the way you serve God. Don't worry about how I serve God. I want you to be comfortable serving God the way you serve God. Amen? To come to know, to experience, to perceive again, right? Holy Spirit will bring all things back to remembrance, right? The Holy Spirit, there's something that, something that is supposed to be a part of you, something that God doesn't want you to lose, right? He'll, he'll make sure that, that he comes back to it. But the way that you don't lose it, the way he doesn't have to remind you, is that when you find out a principle of God, you begin to ruminate on that thing. You begin to chew the cut of that thing. You begin to, to act that thing out. You begin to live it, right? See, see, see this attitude of God ain't through with me yet, and, and I'm working on it, and all those things, only holds up your living, right? It only holds up your living. At the moment that God reveals, pulls back an aspect of who he is, steps out of eternity and into time and reveals something from the throne room to you, this is where you have to now take this thing and make it precious to your life. As you make these things precious to your life, then you adopt them. As you adopt them, you begin to replay these things over and over and over in your life. And as you replay these things over and over in your life, they become a part of who you are, right? And as they become a part of who you are, then this aspect of God is now working. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, right? He will do exceedingly abundantly above all that I'm able to ask according to the power that works within me. How does it work within me if I don't adopt it? How does it work within me if I don't take it as an aspect of myself? So in order for me to have this ability, in in order for me to have this authority, I have to now perceive it to be true. And when I perceive it to be true, I just don't set it on the shelf. I bring it inside of me and make it a part of who I am. Does that make sense? Come on, come on, come on. Personal recognition. Coming to know something clearly and distinctly as true and valid. So, so, so this is what I get all the time. Pastor, can I ask you a question? 
I don't understand what this means, right? And so, and so you got to know me that I'm not going to come up with an answer, right? Y'all should have been around me long enough to know that I'm not going to make up a deep answer. If I don't know it, I'll say, hold on, let me get back to you. Let me look this up, right? And if I do know it, I'm going to give it to you from a theological standpoint and not just a feeling, right? You know that about me, right? Okay, so now it says, coming to know something clearly and distinctly as true and valid. When I give you an answer, or God gives us an answer, or another, or, or, or another person who you would believe uh, would, would give you the right answer, gives you something according to your life from a scripture standpoint, what do you do with it? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? You run with it? Do you run with it? Research, my man. You better go look it up for yourself. You better go look it up for yourself. Because you might trust me, because you know I'm not going to do you no harm. But, that, but, but, but you might find my answer in another answer. Am I right? Am I right? You're right, right? And so, and so now, Uncle, am I right? Yeah. Look, look, look. And, and what it does is it, it takes you, because listen, if you rely only on me, if you rely only on me, you'll only learn to my capacity, right? God may want to do something in your life that takes you past my capacity, but because you are not relying on God and you're relying on me, who read the word this week? Deli bread? <laughs> Listen, proverb a day will fix your life, man. A proverb a day. 31 proverbs. After 31 days, flip back over and do a proverb a day. Proverb a day will change your life. Listen, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This is the stuff that you find in there. Make, make sure you, you attain to godly counsel. Uh, 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 wisdom is the principal thing, right? And, and I've told you that, that wisdom is the proper use of knowledge, right? And so now when you ruminate on these kind of things, right? When you ruminate on these kind of things, they become a part of you. They become arrows in your quiver, you begin now to be able to attack life instead of always being on the defense because you, life is bogging you down and all these issues of life are coming on you and you don't know how to get out of it. And so all you do is know how to put up the shield of faith. But there's a sword that comes on the other side of that thing. And God wants you to be a weapon. He doesn't necessarily want you to be always bogged down and taking the fiery darts of the world. He wants you to also to be able to combat the world with knowledge. Come on. Knowledge communicates. Next slide. According as his divine power hath given us unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. I'm not, going to ask, I'm not going to ask you to do it, but I guarantee that if I asked you who doesn't feel complete in this room, there would be some hands that go up. But the scripture says, according as his divine ability, have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. He's given us every aspect of life that we need. He's given us every spiritual aspect of life that we need. But a lot of us feel, a lot of us feel incomplete. And the reason why we feel incomplete, because this is one thing we lack, through knowledge. Because when you don't know, you just don't know. But he's telling me that completeness for life and completeness for godliness is in understanding who he is. The Bible says that Jesus said, for all of you who are heavy laden and burdened, all of you who are carrying these issues of life and they're bogging you down, he said, listen, just come learn of me. Amen. He said, listen, if there's anything that you need to learn, stop trying to find it everywhere else and just come learn of me. Because let's check this out. I said that theology is the science of God and it's the science of all sciences, right? 
No information goes out into this world unless it goes past God's desk, right? He is the giver of all information. No matter what the scientists find, no matter what their, what their theories are, or what they believe that they can see, no matter what we hold on to, God says, without me, there is nothing, right? And so check this out. You may want to go into an area of life and you think that you need to study this first before you study God. You need to study God before you study law. You need to study God before you study cooking. You need to study God before you become a counselor. You need to study God because God has a destiny for you. He has a purpose for you. And it may be wrapped up in your gift of cooking. It may be wrapped up in your gift of counseling. But if you don't know God, you don't know anything. I'm trying to tell you, the beginning of knowledge is fear of the Lord. Lord. Come on. He has called us to glory and virtue. Next slide. Back up one. God highly values knowledge. Holly, holly. We can look all over the Bible, right? And realize that God loves knowledge. If you if you if you if you don't like to learn, you're missing something about living, man. I, Godly knowledge produces a power, right? Godly knowledge, listen, godly knowledge, godly knowledge produces a power. There is there is a knowledge, because faith is a knowledge. Faith is a knowledge. It, it is a higher sort of knowledge. And what happens with faith, faith gives us the ability to see past a three-dimensional realm. Faith gives us the ability to see down the road, right? Faith gives us to have peripheral vision that our eyes cannot reach. You see what I'm saying? And so now we have this faith that we apply to this information of living. And as, as life happens we have, and we gain information in life, there's this thing of faith that enables itself to sit on top of what we know. And the reason why is, is because God wanted to open up heaven to you. You see what I'm saying? And so as God wants to open up heaven, he gives us the ability to see farther than what we can experience and the reason why he gives us the ability to see farther what we can experience is because he wants us to be conquerors in this life and so in order for us to be conquerors in this life we have to go past what we can see in our physical eyes and see with our hearts and our mind and our soul in order but check this out it has to be from a godly perspective and so that means that it doesn't tickle our flesh but it quickens our spirits you see what I'm saying? So as we take on this information from God, as we as we operate in the world and God sends down information, you have to make sure because the enemy knows how to masquerade himself as an angel of light. And so because the angel knows how to masquerade himself, when God gives this power, this knowledge that turns into wisdom, you got to know that it has to make God and it doesn't necessarily make sense. You see what I'm saying? Because if it does not make God, and I'm not telling you to make church. I'm telling you to make God. There's too many people doing church and not doing God. We have church attenders who will not live a godly lifestyle. And that's not what I'm talking about attending church. I'm talking about this God, this spirit of God, this life of God permeating through the believer. The blood bought, the blood washed, sanctified, most child of the most high God. That's who I'm talking about. Godly knowledge communicates this power to us. And godly knowledge denotes assurance. I know that God is on my side. It produces me believing in the promises of God. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Next slide. His divine power, the Holy Ghost is described as a power from on high. Luke 24, 49 says, and he is usually uh, the medium whereby God bestows grace. So, 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 y'all know the story about when, when I was trying to get on the car lot, right? I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of the world. I got ankle bracelet on my leg because crime don't pay, Right? And so because crime don't pay, I got ankle bracelet on my leg. I'm trying to get out of an $8.35 an hour job and into six figures of living. And look, look at this jump. He didn't take me from $8 an hour and to give me 12. He didn't take me from 12 to give me 15. He took me from $8 an hour to six figures immediately, right? I mean, immediately. I mean, immediately, right? And so, and so how do I get to this place? 
but by revelation of God, right? So, so, so I'm in church. I'm in my proper place. I'm serving God with my life. I'm, I'm, I'm deacon. I'm armor bearer. I'm Sunday school teacher. I'm, I'm preacher now. As a matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm preacher now. And, and God said, no, I wasn't preacher yet. I was not with the box. I was still deacon, right? And, and, and the preacher's preaching. Check this out. The preacher's preaching and he stops and he turns to me and says, off topic, boy, you've been broke and God's about to bless you financially. Listen, listen, I could have, I could have assessed my $8 and 35 cents an hour. I could have assessed the roaches that were in my TV. Don't you know the most embarrassing thing is to have a roach just stop. <laughs> it didn't mean keep crawling. And then he keep crawling while the person had their head down and was getting a drink of water. He just, and, and look, you plucking the screen trying to, why'd I get there? Anyway, <laughs> that's the most embarrassing thing, right? But it was where I was at in life, right? Because crime don't pay. Eventually, you got you to gotta sow what you reaped. You, you see what I'm saying? Roaches in my bed and all these kind of things. When the, when, when the, when the bishop spoke to me and revealed from Holy Spirit what God has said about me I had a choice to denounce it or receive it I had a choice he said man you don't know where my life is set up the issues of life could have burdened me but 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 instead I received it with gladness immediately and as I received it with gladness and immediately Within 30 days, I'm staying on the car lot. 30 days, boom, scared out of my mind. Don't know what I'm doing. Don't know how to use a fax machine. Don't know how to use a credit card machine. Don't, li listen, I'm, I'm fresh off an ankle bracelet, standing in front of people that work at the Pentagon, buying cars. I don't even really know how to talk to these people. I don't really know how to address them. But for some reason, I started to become more successful than anybody in the building. And when they started asking me why I was successful, you know what I said? Because God, I, I, I trust God to pay my tithes. I trust God to pay my tithes. I trust God to pay my tithes. I trust God to pay. They said, okay, well, what are, you, what are you saying to them on the phone? The same thing, the script that you got? What are you saying when they come in the door? Welcome to Leesburg Toyota. How may I help you? My name is Jamal Cooper. Here at Leesburg Toyota, we do things a little bit different. In order to expedite your visit, I'd like to uh, find out what's important to you in the car. Is that okay? Great. Right this way. We have coffee, tea. Soda, water. Would you like ginger ale, Pepsi, Coke, Diet Coke, coffee? Great, I ain't got to spend a dollar. Here. Here's your coffee, sir. Would you like in it? Oh, you like it black? Great, here you go. Right? Same thing that the way they were trained, I was trained. But for some reason, for some reason, I was superseding the whole building. I'm superseding the whole building. And, and these, these, are, these are dudes who have been selling cars for 10 or 15 years. They spent their life on the car lot. What is it, what is it, what is it, this grace that's being bestowed on my life? But I'm telling the boss at $8 an hour when he's hiring me, oh, I saw on the door that you're open from 12 to 5 on Sundays. Check this out. If I can't go to church, I can't work here. I'll stay in $8.35 before I go and make your 100 grand. He said, well, come after church. I said, well, I live in Martinsburg. You're in Leesburg. My church don't get out to 1.30. I won't get here to 2.30. I said, but you close at 5. He said, I don't care. Just come. I said, oh, for real? He said, yeah, just come. So, so grace. I took a stance for God. You, you see what I'm saying? I took a stance for God. This grace is bestowed. It is available to you. Grace and peace be multiplied through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. A lot of us would drop our relationship with God if I was if you was making eight dollars an hour and chase that hundred grand in a minute. And you know what? I wouldn't think that you were a fool. I wouldn't. But there's some of you that may be bold enough to take a stance for Jesus instead of making your own way and allow God to make a way for you. I would not think that you're crazy if you came to me and said, Pastor, I'm making $8 an hour. I got a chance to make 100000 but I won't be in church every week. I'll be in church every other week. I tell you, go get it. Go get it. I was just crazy enough. I just believed God enough. I told my pastor this. You know what he said? Don't take it. 
It was like he punched me in the eye. I malfunctioned for a second. He said, don't take it. Trust God, son. And I said, if I can't work on, if I can't go to church on Sundays, I can't work here. Okay. Go to church. It worked. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Taking a stance for God in life. Taking a stance for God in life. Sometimes willing to sacrifice your own future, your own family for Jesus. I mean, y'all just don't know the story, man. Y'all just don't know the, the path that we took to get to a good place in life with God. Come on, come on, come on, Alex, come on. You might know because I tell you everything. Come on, next slide. Come on, go back to the scripture. Scripture. There's a scripture in there. Get the scripture. Yeah. It says, no, not that one. The next script, scripture. Come on, Alex. <laughs> Verse 4. He says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. This knowledge of God, this divine nature, and this knowledge of God brings to us these exceeding great and precious promises. Listen, listen, listen. This is a, what else I've heard as pastor. Yeah, yeah, pastor, I know, but, but that works for you. That works for you. I sat with some pastors two years ago, right? And I'm sitting around this table, and they're saying, no one comes to church in this town. No one goes to church. No one, and all of them are agreeing, yep, 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 no one goes to church. And, and, and I'm the youngest one there, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to them, and, and, and I said, I said, the, the reason why no one's coming to your church is because you talk like this. You know what the pastor said? Yeah, yeah, I know, name it and claim it. I know, name it and claim it. But, I, but, but, but for real, people don't go to church. Well, well, if you operate by what you see or this higher sort of knowledge, the higher sort of knowledge, faith, right? The Bible says it is impossible to please God but by faith, right? So if I expect you not to come to church, guess what I believe? Guess where my faith is wrapped up in, right? But if I expect you to come to church, then my faith is wrapped up in that God is going to continue to send people to this ministry that are hungry and thirsty for salvation, that want to be saved, that want to be changed, that want Jesus, right? Even if they don't know it when they walk in the door, I bet you they know it, that they need God in their life when they leave. But, but, but this divine nature, that there's all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to us, through the knowledge of him, right? Through knowledge, it, this, this thing is unlocked. The door is unlocked based on information. And this is crazy. You would think by default that I get something because now I'm God's child, right? But God says, listen, now that you're my child, I've given you the key to the door. But once you get into the room, you got to do something with what's in the room. You can't just stand at the door and say, oh, this is nice stuff. I'm supposed to pray? Okay. Listen, if you were walking in the desert, right? and you were about to die from, uh, from thirst, and you came to a body of water, what would you say? If I drink that water, it'll save my life. I'm going to sit down right here beside this water, and I'm going to look at it, because it's going to save my life eventually. Oh, my God. Lips cracked up white. You can't swallow no more, right? Body fat malfunctions are starting to break down, right? You even ponder, if I, if I drink my own waste, my own mess, right? Because the Bible says this, that a dog will return to back to his vomit like a person returns back to his sin. You'd rather sit there and wallow in your mess than it is to drink out of God's fountain, right? And so now... And so now, once you're in the room, you can't just sit in the room. You got to do something with the, with the equipment that is in the room, right? So listen, listen, some of you get a job and don't get in on the job what you're supposed to do. Listen, this is how this machine works. This is how you're supposed to do this. This is how you're supposed to do that. And you just look at it. How long are you going to be there? 
Well, we, let's move you to another department. Let's see if this works better for you. And you just go. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. Did you try? Well, I can look at it and tell. I don't know. That's not for me. That's not who I am. That's not how I do things. Okay. Okay. Well, let's try something else. What if I bring you into the office? Listen, I used to work on the road crew, right? They had me out there. You know, I don't know how they do it now, but back then, in order to do the blacktop, they gave me a, stro a shovel, and you had to go behind the truck, and you had to hit it, and then lay it out. And when you laid it out, the roller came and rolled it out. They still do it that way? They don't do it? Something like that. Well, do you know where I ended up? <laughs> Look, James Frisbee, some of y'all know James Frisbee, right? James all strong and brolic, right? I was a little skinny dude. James was taking it. I was going, it's hot too. I don't like outside. And, I, and the car, and then, the, then the, the truck started hitting me in the legs. They said, Jamal, we're going to send you in the shine, sign shop. Next thing I know, I found myself in the sign shop. Uh, Greg Mason. Greg Mason was in the sign shop. He said, don't do nothing, right? Just sit down. I'll make all the signs. We'll never have to leave. They'll come get the signs, put the signs up. I sat the whole summer. Don't you know that's not life? That's not God? It's not that easy. It's not that easy. It's just not that easy. Application. The Bible tells us to apply the living word of God to our life, to walk circumspectly in the word. That's not life. That was easy, right? When the summer was over, guess what happened when I reapplied next year? No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You can't come back. Because, because... Because just because I've been promised something, just because I've been exposed to something, doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to conquer it if I don't do nothing about it. You cannot just show up and think that the, the back work is not to be done. You got to do the back work in order for this God to be shown in your life. Amen? So, so, so these precious promises. Listen, sometimes we read stuff in the Bible and we equate it to ourselves, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. This promise was given to King Solomon. This promise was given to King David because it sounds good to us. We apply it to our lives. But let me tell you what, let me show you what really applies to you. In Romans chapter 1, it says, and this is a universal promise. This is a universal promise. Romans chapter 1, where is it at? Tell me where it's at, Antoine. Before or after Acts. You don't know. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> it says for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes that's a promise that's a promise that salvation will come to everyone who believes right that's a promise that's given to every single person so check this out but that by these you might be partakers of this divine nature this divine nature that is given to us through knowledge that unlocks more grace and more peace that unlocks godliness and everything that pertains to life has been given to me right this 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 nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust everything that i desire that is not like god this divine nature has puts a hook in my spirit to keep me from falling subject to the things that I desire that are wrong. This this divine nature, because Paul said, whenever I do good, evil is always present with me. It's not that I don't have a choice to do bad. It's the fact of the matter that I have a hook that's on the inside of me that keeps me from doing bad because I've learned that I subject myself to God more than I subject myself to my desires. And as I subject myself to God, he keeps me, he holds me, he produces inside of me this resolve to keep me from falling into situations that are designed to kill me. This divine nature is in a way of escape. The reason why we don't escape is because of more fear than faith. Come on, give God praise.